even at 37 years old, like I'm, I'm still trying to get over feeling weird or different. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, like, and there are days where I don't want to be interesting. There are days where I just wish I fit in. I had three complete strangers and three friends completely unprovoked be like, you should try drag. I am at play and the DJ comes on the microphone and is like, hey, we're bringing back open stage night. If you or somebody you know wants to try drag, now's the time. And so I was like, well, I mean, I guess it's the time to try it. Like you can do it in your bedroom all you want, baby. Like if you want to get painted, put on a wig and a dress and twirl around in your bedroom to Britney Spears, go off. I'm not trying to stop you. But like what we're doing here in this room for these people only exists because of them. It was, what do you do? Why should I care about, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you a man or woman? Are you rich or poor? Instead, I think we're starting to shift conversations to more just treating each person as like an individual, but we're all human. This is Rooted Recovery Stories. I'm Patrick Custer and gosh, I am so excited to be here today with my friend. She's the mouth of the South. Some might call her. She's, <laughs> <laughs> she also helps to put the all in y'all, not only in the South, but on the national stage, Fidelia and Gentry. Hi. I'm so, so glad to welcome you to the show. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I said that like a question, but I didn't mean it that way. I'm very excited to have you here. Yeah. <laughs> I am very excited to have period you. period on period on period. I love it. We've got so wait, this has been a long time coming. Truly. This has been a long time coming. You have quite the story, but have done so also so much to, I, I hate to say rewrite your story, but take control of the narrative Yeah, and help others to do the same. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited to get into the meat of that. But just like every story we tell on this show, um, you know, there was always a before. Like, what happened to bring you to the point today? You know, and I want to I want to start by by going there. Where were you from? Well, um, the short answer is Nashville. Um, I was raised in a part of town called Antioch, and my family was there. Um, I was there probably from age three to 18. Um, my parents met in the Navy. So like the first couple of years of my life, we were doing like Navy brat things. I was born in Charleston. Then my brother was born in Monterey, California. And then we moved here when they both went reserve. Uh, we lived in Donaldson first. And then I grew up in Antioch. Uh, and then after graduating high school, bopped around for college a little bit. I was in upstate New York and the Dallas area. And then I've been back in Nashville since uh, 2014. Wow. Mm -hmm. That was a very concise, um, well, you know, there's there's yeah. more travels that happen through there, but <laughs> yeah. When you think back to your childhood, do you remember the first time that you realized you were different? Uh, I, I mean, there's the moment that we got to in one of the three therapy sessions I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I stopped going is because the guy died. So that's for the next therapist to deal with. Oh, God. yeah. Uh, one day, one day we'll we'll unpack that one. But in one of those sessions, we, uh, I think it was like EMDR, we uh -huh. did some like regressive stuff. And there was a moment when I was in either like after school care or preschool care, like around age four, five, six, that I remember just being very like happy go lucky, fun loving, just kind of like uh, living my life. And um, there were some boys who, um, had chosen that they were going to queue up Michael Jackson's beat it to like right before the line beat it. And then like summon me to them when like not friends with them, like just these two guys. And then like, as I got there, like play the line, beat it just for a joke. Um, and you know, like to an adult who cares, right? Like not a big deal, right. but that's the first moment that I recall, um, realizing that people would be mean just for the sake mm -hmm. of being mean. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of feels like a moment where it sounds cliche, but that, that my innocence was stolen mm -hmm. in a way. And I think that there was a lot of experiences and like data that my brain garnered over the years that yeah. sort of reinforced what I learned in that moment. And I've had to, you know, spend some time unpacking that. Obviously three therapy sessions is not enough to unpack all of that, but you know, you can kind of start there and do some unraveling at the very least. Most of definitely. what's going on. Um, so, well, and that's, you know, it's, we oftentimes remember those because they're the beginning of what like founda foundationally starts to write a pattern for us yeah. because we say 
that it becomes part of what we we let be our identity that yeah. I'm that I'm weird. Yeah, and somehow yeah, yeah. that I'm attached. That's attached to being bad. Mm -hmm. And um, well, because it's never it's never said. I mean, up until you know, like maybe when you become an adult and and find your chosen family, people will start saying oh, you're so weird. Like right. not as a pejorative, but it's right. But it's meant to cut you down when mm -hmm. people say it at, at that age. I know you went to an art school. Mm -hmm. Well, I what guess a was... liberal arts school, but yes, our, our arts program was very strong. Um, I mean, do you want to talk about just like kind of how I got involved in like yes. creative and stuff in general? And then like what I'm very curious about from society, like society as you know it, how were you othered? Okay. Um, so I guess like... I mean, if you talk to my parents, like even from like a toddler age, like I was the bang on pots and pans kid as opposed to my brother who was the roll the ball kid. Mm -hmm. um, and that definitely like carried on. Like my brother ended up playing sports all through high school, um, soccer specifically, whereas like from age four or five, I was in piano lessons. Um, there was a piano in the house growing up. My mom played piano quite a bit um, as a child. Um, and then like my dad has a little bit of like musical background as well, like plays guitar and and likes to do some songwriting. He's actually learning piano now in his retirement. Wow. Um, and so that got me into kind of like the creative field in general. Um, and then, I, I mean, I didn't really realize that actually I was thinking about coming to do this today and kind of thinking about art and creativity and, and addiction and vices. And, mm -hmm. and I, I think for me, um, there's definitely a part of me that uses my my like creative outlets as a vice as well in the sense that like especially in classical music i come from sort of this like pedagogical background and technique and discipline and i think that like the discipline part of it kind of overlaps into sort of this like self-flagellating mm -hmm. kind of place because there are definitely a lot of moments i remember especially in my teenage years that I would be upset about something and that would be the time that I was like, I'm locking myself in my bedroom and practicing for three, four or five hours, like just nonstop. Because if Not, you did that, then what? I mean, if I wanted to think about it too much, then I'd be better, you know, then I, then I'd be, and then if you, you would be better, me, then, then you what? reject me. Then I, then, you know what I mean? Like, yes. that's, and that's like something I've realized about myself, you know, thank you to TikTok for being a therapist. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, like with rejection, I, I think that I am one of those people that is very much like, it's me, I'm the problem, what do I have to fix? I have to be better. Like that's that's my like first go-to Yeah. Um, all the time because I'm also, I, I'm diagnosed, diagnosed ADHD. Um, I, I feel very strongly that my um, neurodivergence overlaps somewhere into the autism spectrum as well. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it does on a, on a medical level or not, there's a lot of symptomatic overlap and things that I'm like, yes, that happens to me as well. Um, and rejection sensitivity, um, dysphoria, um, seems to like really hit home for me because something can be a situation where the smallest part of me is rejected and it, at least for a short period can crumble my entire sense of self. So for the person who doesn't know or just went, what the hell did she just say? <laughs> Explain, can you just simplify, re reject, reject, I can't Rejection even say sensitive it. dysphoria. Yes. yes. Um, I mean, t to my understanding of it, so dysphoria, like being the opposite of euphoria. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of just feeling like out of sorts, out of body, like not at one with, with me, like that I'm not comfortable in my skin, mm -hmm. that like this is wrong. Um, and so when there's a moment where say it's like, I don't like your haircut, mm -hmm. then you don't like me. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, it becomes this like one part is the whole yeah. thing kind of thing. And so somehow I don't know what the chicken or the egg is, but that all like circles back to this, like must get a better haircut, must take better care of my skin, must bleach my teeth, must go to the gym, must, you know, like must practice, must do better, must be better. Um, and I, I mean, where does it come from? Maybe. No, I think you hit the nail on the head, chicken or the egg, like because chasing that, where does it, st where did it start? Where does it come from? Mm -hmm. Is very difficult. Some, some of us never, I mean, cause I think it's more of a, we get it from all different areas of society, but especially those of us um, who are in the LGBTQ uh, sphere. Um, I think that like, it's little messages all through our life and, and 
America, I, I can't speak for other countries, but I know where we grew up, that it contributes to that narrative mm -hmm. for sure. And I think that you're not, I mean, I know you're not alone oh, yeah. um, in that I, I personally can relate to, you know, I was joking with another um, gay man the other day about how we've had so many, like it's so common for us to have um, like, everybody has periods of their life where you look back and it was like that period or this period. I mean, but for a lot of us gay men, like we have like, we have like this period had a whole different look. Oh, like yeah. on, on an almost like sociopathic level oh, because I yeah. had <laughs> like a completely different identity, you know, and then this period, like where many people have that in teenage years for those, many of us under the rainbow, it's like, no way later. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and maybe that in a way like means that I won't say weaker sense of self, but like a less developed sense of self in adulthood because it's had less time to mm -hmm. sort of brew or steep or, or germinate or whatever the, the metaphor is there. But well, I think it's a couple things. I think that for some of us, it's a, our sense of self continues to attach to a new meaning because we're still trying to find worth and value. Yes. And maybe this evolved sense of self that or what, what we think is an evolved sense of self <laughs> <laughs> is one that's going to get us to this place like over there. Yeah. Over there or, or up there that where we're cl like climbing to because we just constantly feel like where we are isn't. Yeah. Even though we're like, preaching and touting all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Like be in your own skin, yeah, you yeah. know, and whatever. But the fact of the matter is not a lot of us are talking about the fact that even Hello, I'm in, I'm in regular therapy. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, wow, brag okay. much. <laughs> no, what I mean by regular is be, like, I regularly go, um, but, and I didn't mean to brag. I just, I, like, I just <laughs> meant though, that even though I am in, in regularly oh, doing so your therapist is alive, <laughs> it's not TikTok. That's for sure. I'm just kidding. No, thank you. I, you know what? I, a lot of people poo poo on TikTok therapy, but there. I think that there's a lot of healing to be had for the people that aren't able to, for whatever reason, go to therapy right now. And they're receiving access to some helpful tools and different things because of that information. Yeah. Um, and I, I, for me, at least the fact that I keep myself cognizant of the fact that like I got here because of an algorithm, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. That like, oh, I can like, I lingered on another video for a second that like uh -huh. led me to this one uh -huh. and I can be like, that other one didn't resonate with me. So like, it's just the algorithm that got here. This doesn't have to be mm -hmm. something that resonates with me either. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think as long as I keep it in that context, I'm not, I'm not completely relying on sure on what somebody's just randomly telling me through the algorithm. So is it looping back just a second? I love that you kind of led into this because the conversation around connecting drag and the art to, I think you used it as a vice, you used the word vice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Being someone who I've done, I did drag once. It was terrible, and uh, you're probably never going to see a picture of it, or at least <laughs> it won't be public. Maybe I'll show you. But Ooh. I say that to say, you know, obviously this is you have mas mastered the art and become well, very well respected for your craft. Um, so I don't want to speak to this from. I want to speak to this from a standpoint of I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes. But this is a great conversation to be had. One that is drag in all its glory and for all that it is and for all that so many people through the decades have used it for can be like many things in creativity leaned on in a way to step into a different persona, to escape, to... Um, numb mm -hmm. to avoid right but it can also be something that leads you to embrace parts of yourself that are really there that you would never do out of drag and yeah. so i'm interested to hear about like what from your perspective in the drag world you see and also how has that played a role in your life um, so I think for me, um, the biggest sort of factor in drag as an artistic medium that I'm like, that's why I continue to do it is live performance is being on stage in front of a live audience. 
Um, and we kind of touched on like my background being like piano and then like I have degrees in classical viola performance. Like I, I figure skated. So like being like on stage in some format, being in front of an audience, mm-hmm. I think has for a long time felt like the most legitimate way for me to connect with other people. Mm-hmm. And I, and this is apparently something that like can be a through line for, for ADHD, autism and like similar neurodivergence. There's, there's a, a constant feeling, even when I am not like on stage of, of being perceived. Like I jokingly call it main character energy, but like, it's just like, can I just not like for a second? Can I just be just another person in a bar? And it's like, I, whether it's actually happening that people are, are like actively perceiving me or I'm just thinking that it is, that causes a lot of like social anxiety for me. And so I think being on stage in a situation where I have like the most control over how I'm being perceived, Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the reason that I, that I'm happy there Mm. Um, or, or at least more comfortable there. Um, Cause I mean, I've, had a lot of people in like especially like the last two years like people that don't really like know me from the drag scene have seen me on stage and been like you like are really comfortable up there and I'm like yeah I mean for one I've been on stage for 30 years at this point like Mm -hmm. um and ew that I just had to say that out loud um (laughs) wait you chose to say that out loud for the record I know I know it was the spirits (laughs) that made me do it um yeah but I, so I think that provides me with like a lot of comfort. And then I, I really do like, I really do enjoy it. And we were talking a little bit off camera beforehand, um, you know, performing with Lizzo last year, I, it was 20 something, maybe 30,000 people, which is by far the biggest audience I've ever been in front of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, we were on stage for under five minutes and that like the rush that came from that, mm-hmm. like, I, I mean, if they could bottle that shit up and sell it, mm-hmm. like, I would have a problem. <laughs> like I would have a problem because that is good stuff. Like, okay, so let's separate and talk about for a second the being on stage and the adrenaline of that. Aside from drag, because mm-hmm. I want to, I, I love that you you are speaking to both of these, and I think there's a validity to to separating them and, and talking about them each. Okay, so first, the 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 rush of of being on stage and do and connecting. I love that you outlined this because I've been doing a bit more of this in my line of work as well. And people have been asking me and the best way I know how to describe is, is purely that like, if you're doing what you love connection for those of us who are either performing or doing something in the public eye, um, is one of the most true and in a way virtuous, I truly believe this in, in my heart, virtuous um, things you can do when some people would look at this and say it's about vanity. It's about, right, that rush that you're feeling, to me, you're describing what it feels like to feel these windows and moments of full actualization. Mm -hmm. Is that not the goal to find your, what your meaning is where you actually feel the most connected because you're doing what you were fully called to do. Whether it's like doing or being or existing as like your, your truest self. Right. Um, I, I don't know if it's an original RuPaul quote, but like one of the like mantras that I've heard from her that I've always resonated with is, um, when you become the image of your own imagination, that's the most powerful thing you can do. So like when you can like take what you see yourself as your head in your head and and become that out in the real world, like nobody can stop you. And, and I think that drag as an art form, like kind of insists that we push ourselves as close to that as possible. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where like a lot of power in drag comes from. Yeah. Um, I am definitely one of those people that like, like I'm still compared to like the average bear, like at least very good at feigning confidence and, and, and you know, feigning security, uh-huh. um, high functioning masking, you know, uh-huh. very, very good at that stuff. But, but in drag for sure, like it feels less like a game and less like I'm trying to do it and more just kind of like, ah, here I am. Mm-hmm. Like I, I can just be, um, and, and, you know, like we don't, we can 
come back to this or take some time on it right now. I mean, there have definitely been conversations that I've been involved in and, and just kind of, you know, like little nudges from from friends who are who are part of the trans community. And I've questioned, like, is is that a thing? Um, and at least for where I am right when now, when you say that a thing, um, I know it, what you mean. Let's but well, explain is, that a little bit more. It like is the comfort that I find being up in drag indicative of the fact that I I may be transgender. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people that have suggested yes, and there are moments where I felt like oh, very maybe yes. Um, but I, I think at at very least where I am right now that it's more of a fluidity mm -hmm. kind of situation and. And I, I think I like being able to have my my masculinity and my femininity. I don't got much masculinity, but like what I do have, like I kind of want to keep around. Um, and I think also like, you know, just listening to the experiences of other trans people, there are trans people who, who will look at in, in the mirror at the body that they were born into. And I mean, it's highly dysphoric immediately. Mm -hmm. And that's not a thing for me. Like I, and so like, you know, there's there's a lot of nuance there, and everybody's experience is different. Um, but for me, I think gender is kind of just I don't know. I kind of don't really. Yeah, there's so much. There's so much. I don't really want to slap a label it, yep, on it, kind yep. of thing. Like, I'm just kind of trying to vibe. Yeah. <laughs> when we were growing up, I think that it was. I know that it was just like. In the past decades, it was just so important for everybody to like. The either or the water yes, the binary. and even as we're yeah um i mean just everything is and i like i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing what this the generation do we now have two generations below us technically is it the what x and z is that correct i don't know I, why do we keep dating ourselves um and I, <laughs> anyway the those who are coming after you and I to change society, I'm excited to watch um, the what I hope and and believe is a positive direction. Um, yeah, I think especially like on the topic of gender yeah. and and sexual orientation and how how those you know put us out into the world. Um, I, I think like the millennial generation, especially mm -hmm. like the younger end of the millennial generation, like really kind of started that conversation yeah and then wh whoever came immediately after us i guess it's z right is it z okay yeah. i think it's just z oh there's alpha the babies are gen alpha, alpha. that's right that's right yeah um i think that z really like kind of took that conversation about as far as it could go uh -huh. because i think it was still framed in this not really a spectrum so much as like a scale Mm -hmm. Like like the Kinsey scale, like zero mm -hmm. through six, but there's not there's not like a one point two on it. You know what I right. mean? Um, and so, I think that Gen Alpha, at least like you know, in my sort of internet experiences with them, like the content that I see from that generation, they almost seem to be post gender. Like it's just, who cares? Right. Like like nobody cares like at all like we got way bigger fish to fry yeah. than like what's between your legs and what that means you call yourself mm -hmm. like and, and i th i think that that's kind of like on most things where we're breaking down a binary we should be moving towards a spectrum not a list yeah there should be a, a lot of nuance and gray area um and and i think that even then after that like we should have to not talk about it at all that like Cause that's the real reason we have to bring it up. Like right. we have, we are throwing labels on things for the sake of having discussions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we can, if this trend continues, get to a point where like, we don't have to have that discussion anymore. Right. So it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter. Right. Um, well, and like we're moving towards like the parts of the person that really do matter. Yeah. And, um, so that's exciting too. Like the inside, I'm going to, I have to reference this first. Have you seen inside out one? I don't believe I have. Adelia and Gentry, your oh. homework when you settle down from all your pride. Not homework. Stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. You, that's. Don't the, they talk about a lot of feelings though? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And this, the second one just came out. And when I tell you, I'm like, because I hadn't seen the first one. So my boyfriend is obsessed with um, that, that movie and both of them now. And now I am too. But we watched the first one earlier this week and then went to go see the second one in the cinema. And when I say we both cried, I mean like tears rushing down. 
But I say that I bring that up because I mean, it's Disney, like, so you think like children, what have you, but no, 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 this, these movies are like, it, it, you can be 90 years old and it's completely (laughs) applicable because it's totally brings the, um, like visual metaphor to all the things that make up your sense of self, sense of self, your, um, you know, all the things about your personality who's driving the boat, why they're driving the boat, um, at what times and all those things. And anyway, the reason why I bring that up is because it's like the, to me, the antithesis of a binary of a way that we have historically had conversations and said, we need to identify or separate. Like it was, what do you do? Why should I care about, you know what I mean? And are you a man or woman? And you know, are you rich or poor? Yeah. And ne- instead, I think we're starting to shift conversations to like the. How do you treat the waiters when we yeah. go out to dinner? <laughs> yeah. And have you read any books recently? Like, yeah. yeah, like more just treating each person as like an individual, but we're all human. Right. Kind of I mean, I I know you're this way. You'll joke in a moment because you're so used to being on stage, but you also will jump right in and have a serious discussion and be like, okay, well, let's talk about that trauma, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's something that like also too is so important that like being able to do that and not shy away from it and be like, don't feel, (laughs) you don't feel your feelings, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This podcast is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health. If you or a loved one are struggling with trauma, addiction, or mental health, We are ready to answer your questions and help you take that next step. Call our admission center at 888-648-4098 or visit us online at www.promises.com. Our team is ready and waiting to answer the call for help. But like, okay, so on top, on the top, like flipping this the side of the coin real quick, I want to dive into the, the using drag, what we were talking about earlier using drag, um, and you said a vice. I want to reframe that because, like, that's your word. I just want to, but but I want to say, like, I think that there's a spectrum of what people use it for, right? Oh, oh, for sure. And that's up to them for, obviously, right? Like, I'm not trying to say anybody, anybody is wrong for how they use it. Um, but it just, like, anything that can be good and healthy for us, right? It can also allow us to avoid, 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 avoid. Avoid, yes. And I'd love to. <laughs> so, yeah. And so that's the thing I want to, so like we talked about the whole like side of being on, the, the side of drag of being on stage and theatrical performance and that kind of thing. But really when we're talking about like the, how through the years you i want to know how you first started to use it what you felt why you felt it um so drag i started about a decade ago um how like what what led to it a a couple of things um so i had been back in town for about six months um i guess i had dabbled like there had never been an intention of like doing drag Mm -hmm. i had been like put in some form of drag before slash like for a bit on stage gotten in a little bit of drag but like 2014 was like the first time that i was like okay i guess i'm gonna like attempt to do drag like i'm gonna create a character it's gonna be like a thing that that happens more than more than one time yeah kind of situation um do you remember the first time you saw drag queen not Film like the, or real life. Not like the specific first moment, but I was 18 here in Nashville. It would have been at, at play. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I guess maybe Mrs. Doubtfire like, yeah. would have been like an occasion before that. But that, I mean. It doesn't as, really, ca- I mean, it counts, but at the same time. It, it doesn't, re- it's not the same. Yes, it's drag, but it's yeah. not like in the same context of like creating this drag persona that like you build a career around kind of thing. Right. Um. When you do you remember like when you first were exposed to drag, what you thought about it at that point? 
I, I think I was very enamored. Um, I mean, I remember like Nicole Ellington Dupre and yeah. and the princess were both on cast at play at the time. Yep. Um, there was also um, Versage. Her tagline was the Velcro Venus Versage. Mm -hmm. um, her specifically, I remember um, just like the theater that could be created by just like being one person with like makeup and hair and a big cot, like the space she could take up, the presence she could have as just one person. Mm -hmm through the art of drag, I think that was really st stunning to me. Um, and so that's like one of the first things, I mean, there's a specific like image in my head of her standing on the catwalk at plate and like twirling yeah. and there's fabric just like covering yeah. the audience. Yeah. Like, um, we were probably there at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Like she was just, yeah, that was great. And then like, m like Nicole Langton Bray is my drag mother and I, I the can see the resemblance. The way she connects to an audience, though, like, and, and like, her lip sync and storytelling, like... 1,000%. Yeah, like, that, something I've always tried to emulate in my own performances. I just recall, especially, like, you know, when, when, she, when we were both younger, um, never left the stage not drenched in sweat because she was putting on a show. Yeah. Um, and... And, you know, again, back to the chicken or the egg thing, who knows when which became important to whom... But to me as an entertainer, to, as somebody who gets on stage, as a drag performer, a musician, whatever, I do it for the audience. Like that's, like that's a, a relationship we've, it's a social contract we've signed together yeah. um, to be involved in this conversation. Um, and so anybody that I see, like an artist who, who very clearly has a, has a simil, similar respect for their audience, I, I have a lot of admiration and respect for yes. um because i just i i think that's like one of the first boxes you've got to check mm. is is understanding that like without them this isn't here yeah. like you can do it in your bedroom all you want baby like if you want to get painted put on a wig and a dress and twirl around in your bedroom to britney spears go off mm -hmm. i'm not trying to stop you but like what we're doing here in this room for these people only exists because of them and and like if you if you don't see that, then like, yes. what are you doing? Yes. You know, if you don't sell any tickets, who cares? If a bear shits in the wood, no one's around to see it. Yeah. Did it shit in the woods? Is that the thing? I don't know. I might have just made that phrase up. But. No, but you just like, you said some things just there and that. Yeah. And, and I think power there. Yeah. And I think I'm passionate about it because I've seen enough people who that's clearly not their POV mm -hmm. taking up space where there are people who want to be there. Mm hmm. Um, and that's always frustrating to see. And that's showbiz, kid. Right, you know? it like, is. That, that's showbiz. <laughs> but I have to throw in there that they're just, they're, there is so much, I, we say this so much, the, the, the straights, uh, <laughs> the straights have football. Mm -hmm. We have drag. Mm -hmm. And listen, I, I hope I didn't offend anybody or I offended everybody equally in that statement. But, you know, uh, as a PR stunt, the best you can hope for is 50-50. Oh, okay. <laughs> and sell a t-shirt to both of them. I yeah. hate Patrick oh. Custer. I love Patrick Custer. That's great. Okay. Hey, Let's that's get what Pepsi those, and Coke get are those doing. printed soon. Um, <laughs> that's smart. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> you just threw me completely <laughs> off my... Th um, just what I wanted to add to that, that piece of what you were just saying is that... Um, I view it as so much more every single time a queen gets on stage, there is a mantle of, I don't necessarily say responsibility, um, but a privilege that they have because they're doing something tra transformative, magical, spiritual in a sense, all the things, because there is a there is a transmission of love, acceptance, taking up space, beauty, owning. I mean, like there's so much just in showing up and being to add on to like what you just said already. Like there's, there's so much there that the audience gets to receive and it might mean something different to every single person there that they, walk away with more value than they came in with. They're reminded that what makes them feel weird outside is what is actually what makes them shine and what makes them special. And yeah, it's what makes you interesting. Yes. Like, 
like big time. And yeah. honestly, I have to remind myself of that like all the time because like even at 37 years old, like I'm I'm still trying to get over feeling weird or different. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, like and there are days where I don't want to be interesting. There are yeah. days where I just wish I fit in. I mean, I'm glad that that wish has never come true. Right. But like, there are days where I'm like, oh God, what's it like to be normal? <laughs> like, and is normal even a real thing? It's not. Like, That's why I, the minute I say, every now and then I say it on this show and I'm like, in real life, I almost gag when I say it too, but I hate saying it when it's memorialized. But yeah, no, normal's not a thing. And I, whenever you contribute, nor, attribute normal to, um, especially heteronormative, whatever, I like, ugh, that's perpetuating the sh mm -hmm. stuff we grew up with, mm -hmm. which... We're, we're getting rid of. You got to yeah. remember, you know, Debbie Reynolds giving us in Halloween Town. Oh, my dear. Being normal is vastly overrated. Yes. <laughs> yes. Such a great line. Most definitely. I should write them all down at some point so I can like reference them all. But there are like things I've picked up from. You have. And they pop out. Yeah. These at, like various mantra. The most wonderful times. Yeah. When they're supposed to. Yeah. Um, it's, it's absolutely great. I want to say. On this topic, um, this is so relative um, to our show and where where we are in the, the conversation right now. You are the first uh, drag queen we've had um, come on the show in drag. We've had two others, uh, lovely uh, queens that we interviewed a few years ago, um, but we've never had anybody show up in full drag. And you're welcome for the beauty. <laughs> thank you it's i mean it is not lost on us the amount of y'all the if you don't know the amount of work that goes into putting on full drag is not for the faint of heart and it's a lot and it's uncomfortable it's uh, much appreciated but you and i were talking about and one of the reasons why i really wanted you to come is not because your your value only lies when you're in costume mm. It's because for us on well, now this, I'm thinking about it like that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's special because for us on this show, we have an opportunity. You, your interview in this space, I wanted it to fulfill something more that we haven't gotten to yet, mm -hmm. which is um, the representation of people who may never go to a space where a drag queen's going to perform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The wonderful, you know, the internet is spreading things many people who are audience viewers you know if you're never going to go to a place where you might see a drag queen but you're going to hit play on this i'm so glad that you're getting to see vidalia because what a beautiful soul and what a beautiful thing and fascinating and all the things it's very special to have this representation is absolutely everything mm -hmm. and um so thank you for putting the effort into showing up today absolutely. as this part of you absolutely it's my pleasure uh, and I, I, I really appreciate that because, I, I mean, you kind of hinted at it, but in the last year especially, the media machine has has brought drag to the forefront in a way that maybe is not positive for mm -hmm. a lot of people especially. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that behind the scenes, like people may have been capitalizing on the fact that like, there is a large portion of Americans that like have never seen a drag queen and will likely never see a drag yeah. queen um, in person. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a subset of people that you can manipulate opinions about very easily. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, like that's kind of, and kind of one of the things that I, I like to do with my drag, like sort of one of my mission statements as a drag persona, especially in the part of the country that we're in. I mean, just America in yep. general is is doing like pro drag PR, like just in my existence. Mm -hmm. um, I regularly perform in spaces that are not gay bars. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm regularly the first drag queen somebody meets. And and to me, especially in the conversation that we've had the last year, it is very important for those people's first impression of a drag queen to be not only like neutral, but good. Yeah. Um, and, and if I can make it good enough for them to tell a good story about drag to somebody else, like that's, that's the goal. Yep. I love one of the first, uh, this movement in Nashville specifically of seeing drag, not just, a, I mean, listen, thank God for, cause the first place I saw drag was also play mm -hmm. and, um, you know, wonderful performances there and everything. But I say, thank God for, uh, 
this movement of we're having opportunities to see drag in so many different yeah. uh, places that are not LGBTQ plus specific um, or even bars necessarily, uh -huh. their venues. Yeah. Um, and I feel like you were a big part of that. And so when I say you're one of the number one names in especially this part of the country I think of that's putting the all in y'all. What I mean by that is doing exactly what you just described. You're helping to create cultural shift and change because this is an art form that doesn't just belong at 11 p.m. shows where everybody's right. got a drink in their hand. Now, there are some drag queens that only belong in 11 p.m. shows. <laughs> <laughs> but but yes, as an art form in general, um, um, I, like it, it, why you know, like it's exactly like any art form, it can be tailored to an audience. <clears throat> yep. Um, and and you know the the again the media wanted to portray like one specific POV on drag, and and it was you know some of it straight up lies, and some of it like a very specific like that's just the way that person does it. Exactly. Kind of and thing. that's, but you can take that to any narrative of any, you can oh, take yeah. it from a sport, you can take it from yeah. cheerleaders, Yeah, I, whatever, you know? Um, but I like really quickly, let's just, like, let's just talk about the, the reality of why has historically drag been in bars with people drinking at night? Because the safest place to be once it was even le like is, a gay bar. Yeah. yeah. I think it's the, the I think it, be, it being an art form that exists pretty specifically within the gay slash queer community. Yeah. Um, when in history, queer people were relegated to mm -hmm. those spaces that that's just kind of why it landed there. Yes. Um, it's not because I, I don't, because there's so much that media that has tied drag queens to this lifestyle of, um, like wild partying, addiction, you know, all the negative, right. The negative spin yeah. of being it's this like, other, okay. What about your pop stars, your movie stars, exactly. your basketball players? Like there's people like that in every genre, right. And, in, in every medium. So it's like, okay. Like, yeah. Like some people are going to be wild, but right. that doesn't, that doesn't mean that they are leaving the house this morning. Like what child can I corrupt today? That's right. Like, <laughs> so I just think it's, it's beautiful what you do. And I love that you are taking, you've, you've not only like, I think you tapped yourself, you know, meaning like, you know, being tapped to do something, uh -huh. right? Like you were like, no, I'm going to like, I can, therefore I will. Yeah. And you've just taken off running. And I, like, I, I am truly amazed as I continue to watch you, uh, do the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. I mean, it was a few when the 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 drag ban was going on the you were on every oh my gosh news outlet across yeah. the nation can i see the pose again <laughs> it's this wig too yes, so it's, it's perfect i love that you wore this wig today <laughs> yeah. um but you know well, in, i'm not wearing a wig this is my real hair we <laughs> it is quite a great wig it looks very natural even oh, the yeah. color um so real <laughs> but we all deserve love we all deserve freedom we, of expression of speech of i mean like and and so thank you for doing what, what you've done, oh, yeah, you know, um, I want to get back. Cause we saw like, we kind of wound around there back to why, um, your first exposure to drag were leading up to why you decided to start. Um, so specifically like 10 years ago when I started, um, I, um, I dated this guy like right when I moved back to town, which like I told myself I wasn't. So like silly me getting into like a relationship like the minute I got back to town. Um, and then as we were kind of fizzling, he was kind of already seeing this other person who happened to be a drag queen. Um, and we, so I met this drag queen through that. Um, and then as gays do, then went on a date with that drag queen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so and kind of like got enamored and was just going to a lot of drag shows yeah. because of that. Um, and play was the place to go. Play is play is a great drag bar. Um, they are, I mean, they have a space designed to showcase drag, mm. which like doing my like years of being in venues and, and hotels and stuff that's like, I'm showing up with a spotlight and hoping for the best. Um, last year, getting back on the play stage, like it's, it's, I, I mean, like not to say anything bad about anybody working there. It's easy. 
like comparatively. It's easy to feel like you look good when there's flashing lights and fog and a spotlight and a great sound system and you're elevated up above. The, like it's much easier to look good when you're in a room designed to showcase it. Right. Um, and so I'm which if you don't know across the country, I think I mean, you were hinting at this, but like many slash most of the stages that our drag performers get get to perform in are nothing like they were an afterthought we're spoiled here yeah like play. i didn't know that until i i had traveled and seen dragon many other big cities yeah. and i'm like because hey. everywhere else it'll be because they built a dance bar or they built a gay bar and they're like oh i guess we're gonna have some drag and they'll shove a little four by four stage into the corner yeah whereas play like very clearly was like we're gonna have a dance space and a show space the show space is is designed to showcase drag it's going to be a drag bar mm -hmm. and I was I didn't turn 18 until after the connection closed, but like the stuff of legend in yep. Bay Nashville. Um, and I think that there was a, a little I mean, in Nashville drag history, like if I had a time machine, like I would go see a lot of that yeah. um, because you can't tell me that a heterosexual told Dolly Parton and Porter Wagner to dress like that in the 70s, like because they did. And we had drag going on in Nashville right. at the time. Right. Um, and and then the 90s, I mean, the few little video clips you can find on YouTube of the Girls of Connection in the 90s, they were doing stuff here in Nashville, Tennessee, in drag that people are not doing today. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, just nasty. Just so good. Yeah. Um, when you say nasty, I understand what you mm -hmm. mean. Nasty meaning like. Yeah, like, yeah, the, yeah, like, like nasty. Yeah. <laughs> like, like really talented. Like really good. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and so when we have that, that sort of framework here, um, I mean, partially, I think that's a reason that it's so important to have more than just an oral tradition and an oral history Yes. so that people have broader access to it in future generations. So they know where they come from and they know what they're building on rather than regularly starting from scratch. Yep. Um, but having that here, I've kind of lost the plot a little bit. Um, no, you're, go you're going right along the plot. Oh, I think that, um, that kind of having that history there, like Yes, play is in the current moment. Like, mm -hmm. what kind of like set us up for this? Now we're in in these other venues and and broadening the Nashville drag scene. Um, but there's still stuff that came before play. Like, it's not brand new to do yeah. high quality drag in Nashville by any means. Um, and and that's not saying that anybody's done a bad job with it. I think that it's just like a history we have to honor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I love that we're getting to talk about this and honor it during like this is our 36th Pride in nashville the first pride we celebrated was merely a parade and and it was 88 yeah over by the parthenon is that right i don't know i think they like but that's over there if you say so yes and <laughs> uh it was two years two years after i was born it's like boggles my mind that like there was i was alive during a time where there wasn't even a, a mm -hmm. pride at all in nashville yeah. um and now it's you know, breaking records. Yeah, it is. It's a two day festival. Yes. And so, okay. Yeah, it's really great. I, I, I want to, I want to cover this because I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss, I want to really flush through the parts of your story that are so important. Going back to how you decided. So you got, oh you got into it because you were exposed, exposed. And then, and, and then further exposed through going to those shows that right. I was talking about exposed to other drag entertainers. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, when I look back at my life, there's so many times that the universe was just like, here's stupid. This is for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is one of those times. I mean, there was like in my head, I'm being very sincere and honest about these statistics in a week's period. I had three complete strangers and three friends completely unprovoked be like, you should try drag. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like when the universe is screaming at you that loud. And then in that same week, I am at play and the DJ comes on the microphone and is like, hey, we're bringing back open stage night. If you or somebody you know wants to try drag, now's the time. And so I was like, well, I mean, I guess it's the time to try it. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I like went home. I was, I had just moved back to town and I spent the first year back in town living with my parents in Antioch and went to Walmart and spent way too much money on all the wrong makeup. Um, and you know, like sat in my bathroom and, and practiced makeup uh, uh -huh. for about a month before the first time I was on stage. And then, um, you know, had that first night, it was, uh, I think December 27th, 2014. Um, and like, <sighs> 
it was it was the stage for me. It was it was the fans. It was the being on stage, the audience. Um, I think also like you know getting to connect in in a medium that's adjacent to music mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. was 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 something I enjoyed as well. Um, I was also like at that time very much looking to as an adult like plug in to a gay because I had I had finished my master's in Texas uh, at like age twenty three. Um, and then just kind of like bopped around. Oh, it around. took you that long? Oh, yeah, right. Um, and then like just kind of like bopped around the Dallas area for like a couple years yeah. after that. But like didn't really like settle down. I wasn't in the mindset of like I'm going to live here for a while. Yeah. So I went to the gay bars, but I wasn't like I'm going to make gay friends, yeah. you know? Um, so I moved back and I was like very much like I need to find like my community. Um, and that I think also that there was like a sense of community that I already saw there was very enticing to me as well. Um, and then I just I kind of haven't looked back. Um, mm. And so the, the doors that were open for me then were those open stage nights that were once a month. I didn't miss a single one for like a year. And then they started being twice a month and I did every single one and then got thrown into a pageant about two years in and like won that and then had to go to nationals for that and like place top 12 at that. And it's like, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the best that I can with the right. tools I have available at that time. Um, so then, you know, I was like, okay, well, I did the best that I could and now. Like I would go back and, and do so much better. Um, just cause I've developed tools. And I love resources. that you just went back to your perfectionism, letting it oh. come out. I wanted to compare contrast really quick, uh-huh. linking back to your perfectionism and the pageantry and how you go back and change things differently. You know, we talked about earlier about how you and all these other things and, you know, scholarly activities and what have you, you know, when you felt that sense of self not being there or value not being there you would go and do whatever 10 times what else can i add to what else can you be more try and be more perfect to bring value or whatnot and i'm curious that like it pops out now and you're like i would go do so much but at the drag thing but in the moment when i'm asking you about uh what that was like why you chose to when you think about your heart and what was happening in that connective space, right? Like the window of opportunity was there. People were calling on you saying, why don't you try this? Because it feels like it's a fit for you. Mm -hmm. And you said yes, because obviously there was something there, but like, was that the first time you were really getting to express yourself in a way that wasn't, that was, that was embracing the you I would not say, the perfection. Yeah, because I mean, like piano, figure skating, viola, like all like very codified, very like there is a system passed down from the people before you. They're like very disciplinary and very. And so drag is very kind of the first time that it was like, yeah, like you can go learn something. And and I will say, like, because of that background, I have a tendency to be a technician first mm-hmm. and an artist second. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like that's kind of how I approach drag is like, let me learn the techniques, but without being put into a system that was rigid, I had so much more freedom as an artist to just kind of like make these choices and like fail on my own. And I hadn't really thought about it until right now when you say that, but there are a lot of moments in in my drag history where like somebody who knew better told me I couldn't be told though. Mm. And you know, like maybe a little regret and like, oh, like maybe I could have learned faster or maybe that would have been a great tool to apply earlier or like shit. Like I was told this five years ago. Why am I just learning it now? But I think now that you say that about my perfectionism, I think I needed to be able to be like, no, this is the way I'm going to do it. Even if it's wrong, it's it's my way today. Um, and and I know that like, oh, wow, this is thoughts that I'm having for the first time a little bit. Um I think I I really like truly love music and the viola and I went to school that the conservatories, especially at the time, what was 15 years ago, um, I went to Eastman for my undergrad. Um, And so like the Eastman's, the Oberlin's, the Cincinnati Conservatory, the Juilliard's of the world at that time were highly focused on preparing, especially string players for orchestra auditions, Mm -hmm. which to me, and this is, I'm not throwing shade at people who do that and love it. To me, and for what I wanted out of music, that was the desk job of music. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the nine to five of music. Um, because, I mean, you you don't make a ton of artistic choices, if any at all, um, in that context. Um, and I'm not sure I knew 
that that was going to be frustrating to me when I got into that track. Yeah. Um, I, I think I had some thoughts about, wow, I really wish I was in a little bit more of like a solo path, maybe around like my senior year of my undergrad. Um, but like still didn't have the language or the, or the wherewithal to like advocate for myself at that time. So then like my masters, I kind of like was in the same rut, like nine hours a week of orchestra rehearsal. Ugh, God, are we playing the same four symphonies again? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, when I got to drag, like I was coming like immediately pretty much off of this master's degree, off of this, like trying to have a career in music, trying to pursue music seriously and experiencing a trauma of being stifled as an artist and a creator. And again, like I'm just like, this is coming to me like right now. Um, so it's interesting that you say that because I think that drag really was like the first time that as an artist from like age five to 27, mm -hmm. that I had found a place that I could just dabble yeah. and just be and experience and try. Um, and so I feel like that probably fueled my protectiveness of that energy. Yeah. You got to express yourself like that. <sighs> It doesn't sound to me like there was an outlet in your life, like your life was all the scholarly things. So therefore, until you found an outlet that you could say, this is a bucket for me, that is one of those. And there weren't limits for you. Mm -hmm. And you look back and you're like, but I made this mistake. You couldn't tell me anything and whatever. That was part of the beautiful journey. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you are the person you are today because of, all the mistakes you made, all the things you had, the lessons you had to learn the hard way or the way that was just supposed to happen. And God, I'm so grateful that you, that all those things transpired just the way that they did mm -hmm. because you wouldn't be changing our community and the nation the way that you are if it hadn't been for that, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And so, I am just so grateful. I, I want to ask you for, you know, as we're talking about, and I'm thinking of a theme for our whole conversation today. I, there's, there's so many, but like when it boils down to, it's like finding worth and value in yourself and embracing that and refusing to, and refusing to just settle. What would you say to the person that has identified with parts of your story that's like, I'm, I don't know. I don't know where in life, you know, like I'm flailing, even though I feel like I'm, I'm being perfect in all the ways that I should be. I haven't found that outlet. I don't know that it's like exactly the answer you're looking for. Um, there's a very recent addition to my, to my mantras list. Um, draft mentality, um, which like Ellen Tift is a songwriting teacher at Belmont that she came across my TikTok with that um, and talking more about like songwriting and just that like as but as an artist or, or as a human in general, like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be perfect to be put out there. That's going to be our title, folks. Like it, you know, and so. I don't know. Like it's been, it's been very helpful for me. I am sure that at some point I will um, screw it up in my perfectionist way and be like, oh yes, I have so many more chances to fix it. And so uh -huh. just, right. But like, and, and that's the same words regardless. Like you have more chances to fix it, but like I have to just make sure that I don't <laughs> yes. do it too many times. I feel like you don't need to add a damn thing to that. And I'm going to just, but, but I want to add to what you just said because it's about you. You said it doesn't have to be per perfect to be put out there. Mm hmm and bringing it full circle to the beginning of our episode where you talked about how um, so much on the stage you feel like uh, you people say you you seem like so put together, but, you know, they don't know. I would beg to differ that your persona, especially when you get on stage, is one of like you really embrace all the things that like if you say something sideways that comes out of your mouth you do what I think that when we talk about like, what are you called to do to be a real connector on stage to change people's life with when you have the gift of a microphone, it's 
you make them feel comfortable in their own skin because you yourself are like, I'm going to embrace that weird side of me mm -hmm. that just said something wrong and we're all going to laugh about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm immediately disarmed and feel welcomed into the conversation and feel all that much more right where I'm supposed to be uh -huh. in my skin, in the place that I'm in and like we're a family and like I belong. Mm -hmm. And I love that about how you present. So that's my way of bringing what you just said full circle. Mm -hmm. And thank you for all of you. Oh, well, thank you for having me and you're welcome. <laughs> I'll do my best to try not to hide any, any of all of this. So <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you for having this me. This has been very special. Yeah, you almost yeah. got a tear out of me. I got a little misty. No, there was one. It was on this eye. So we're going <laughs> to, this camera, um, if you can find it, I think it was minute four. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, with that, we're out of time. But thank you so much. This has been such a treat. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, absolutely. And happy Pride to happy you. Happy Pride. And everyone else. At Stonewall, no one died. That's right. It's so true. Yes. Happy Pride. Um, I'll... Cut us out the way I always do. It is never too late to start loving yourself. And you're always only one decision away from a completely different life. So true. This podcast is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health. If you or a loved one are struggling with trauma, addiction, or mental health, we are ready to answer your questions and help you take that next step. Call our admission center at 888-648-4098 or visit us online at www.promises.com. Our team is ready and waiting to answer the call for help.